We're making it. It's very nice to be here. Finally. Uh, yeah, it was a long flight. Thank you, Nita, for getting me here. Thank you, Isha, for having me over here. And uh, we were detained at the airport, as always, for an hour and a half. It was nice. Yeah, it's, it always happens. It's nice. You know, whenever I start feeling too arrogant about myself, I always take a trip to America. <laughs> In the immigration guys kick the star out of stardom. <laughs> but I, I, I have my small victories. You know, they always ask me uh, how tall I am and I always lie and get away 5 feet 10 inches. <laughs> Next time I'm going to be more adventurous. What color are you? I'm going to say white. <laughs> uh, well, okay. So, <clears throat> I'm supposed to be serious here because this was students and kids. So, first of all, let me just thank uh, the faculty and students of the Yale University. Fellows of Timothy Dwight College and the Chuck Fellowship and Master Jeffrey Brenzel for being so kind. Thank you. Uh, Yale Office of International Affairs and uh, the Yale South Asian Society. And of course, Isha for dealing uh, and following up with the most disorganized and incommunicative person in the world, which is me, to fix today's meeting with you all. I'm really, really happy, very humble, very honored, and thank you. Well, yeah, I have memories of, I have, I've been here before, five years ago I was here in Yale, I was doing the song, some of the shots, uh, you know, the ones uh, at the graveyard, uh, they were shot here, and, uh, no, I'm <laughs> being honest here, uh, and it was very cold, it was, I think, 5th or 6th of December, it was snowing here, and I remember I was doing a song from Kabhi Al Vila Na Kena, and I was, I was trying to kiss Rani Mukaju while mouthing the words. We do that in Bollywood for all the guys who don't know how it is. Yeah, we sing songs and we try to kiss girls at the same time. Uh, and I, 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 I'm being honest, my mouth froze in the middle of Kabhi Alveda Yeah, I, I, I had a love job, yeah. So I'm, I'm hoping my second outing to Yale is a little better because otherwise it just won't sound right if I was to get stuck on. I don't know what you guys call yourself. Yale Tides, Yalers. Yeah, yeah, that... I, I, I hope I don't get stuck at yeah and go beyond that. Eh? So I was told not to dwell too much on my movies when I spoke to you. I am to give you an inspirational talk, tell you stuff you can think about when you leave this room. Now that worries me, gives me performance anxiety. About 1500 of you here hoping to hear words of wisdom from this sexy, desirable man who couldn't kiss a girl last time he was in Yale because it was too cold. But I am, I want, I want to tell you right in the beginning, I'm not that guy. I, I'm the, I'm, I mean, I'm sexy and desirable, but I'm, <laughs> but I'm not about to leave you any more inspired than you were when you walked in here. And uh, I did this lame joke on Google. Yes, I, I go to Google and search everything there. Even my next script I'm searching on Google now. <laughs> uh, and the joke was like this. A dying man gasping for breath desperately gestured to the priest by his side for a piece of paper. With great effort, he then wrote a few words on it, handed it to the priest and passed away. The priest kept the paper in his pocket and forgot all about it until the final service. Here he suddenly recalled the dead man's last scribble. Unfolding the paper, he told the funeral congregation that he was about to read great words of inspiration from the dying man. He opened the paper. The piece of paper had these words on it. You are standing on my oxygen tube, you fool. <laughs> so I'm, 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 I'm going to be kind of like that priest. Don't expect words of wisdom from me. I'm just going to tell you my life journey in very simple words and which may not leave you inspired but will help you survive this life. And if you can do that, kids, if you can survive, happiness, creativity and success will follow on its own. Only I hope my words will give you enough insight when you hear the story that I have to tell you that you can tell the world, world, move over, you're standing on my oxygen tube, I need to breathe, yeah. So journeys can be defined by age and time or even by destinations as most often they are. But I feel it's hard for me to tell you the story of my life in those terms because the concept of time has always eluded me. The day my father died seemed longer than my entire childhood. The day I felt my first success seemed fleetingly hour long, not long enough perhaps. I wondered where it went. Even the cycle of time confounds me. I work the dark, I work the dark until sunrise on most days and fall asleep as the world awakens to light. My friends call me an owl. I like to think of myself as that. Batman, the Prince of Darkness. I, 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 some of you would know I have a superhero fetish, yeah, so I keep bringing this back. Age, age is not my forty either. I still cannot fix my own. Am I forty-five or fifteen? If I could, would I be romancing girls one-third my age who normally would call me uncle? I 
had so much fun collecting the action figures of my last film called Dragon. That, uh, that none of the critical reviews tanking my film affected me at all. And as for my destination, I don't think I ever knew one. I walk, I run in the direction of my dreams. Things change along the way, people change, I change, the world changes, and even my dreams change. I don't have a place to arrive. I just keep doing what I know how to do the best that I can do it. I'll probably end up deluded, a geriatric, in a wheelchair, wearing a cape and tights, imagining my own flight out of this world, but of course with a young girl in my arms. <laughs> so I'll tell you the story of me, but I'll tell it in my own way. In the language of my perceptions, in the things I think matter beyond fame, success and the dying of my grey hair. I have understood that the measure of my life lies in the expanse of my heart's experience and nothing else matters. If you take anything out of it, good. Otherwise, I've been told by the master, I can put on music and dance for you on Shaman Shalom. Okay, so first of all, yeah, we do that later. I know, I know. I, you know, people call me to these serious places and then say, oh, fuck it, everything, just do the dance and go back home. But I insist you listen to me, okay? <laughs> Okay, I, I want to tell you, I, I, I have to uh, uh, <clears throat> tell you that I learned a few big words because I was coming to Yale, okay? Uh, yeah. On Google, of course. And I, <laughs> so the first one that I'm going to tell you about, so there are three things I want to tell you about this evening. Uh, the first one is I'm going to tell you to be a funambulist. Now, yeah, that's a big way, yeah? Impressed? Yeah. So that means a tightrope walker. Because a lot of you people, actually all of you, are somehow are, the, uh, are going to create things in your life. So a phenambulist is like a tight, tight rope walker, okay? So the first word, Alan, please give me claps for this new word that I've got to use. Okay, however I look at it in its eventual analysis, my life has centered around my creativity. I have assimilated the world through creative expression and in return the world has experienced me, hopefully. I've grown to understand that on one hand, the world will always uphold creativity as the most honest feeling possible. On the other hand, the portents of fame, the glitz, the clamor, the wealth that arise from this very recognition of creativity will always be questioned. Why do we do that? Because sometimes it allows us to feel better in the creator, and sometimes it fills a void within us that comes about by being in awe of his or her creation. Either way, it enables us to quantify his or her engagement, engagement with the world around him. I'm an actor. My life is a testament to this duality. George Burns said that acting is all about honesty. If you can fake that, you've got it made. <laughs> and he couldn't have defined it better. Honest and fake, yes, that's what I feel as a creative person all the time. Let me tell you my schizophrenia. Creative expression comes from the deepest experience of the artist himself. A good artist cannot be separate from his creation. Good art is honest art. A man may be an artist, a writer, a sculptor, an actor, or a totem pole carver. Whatever he is, if what he creates is true to himself, it becomes a vivid testimonial to human creativity. If it lacks honesty, it is entire, its entire premise is a waste. At the same time, and quite paradoxically, a man becomes distinct from his creation from the moment it is placed in the public domain. It no longer even belongs to him. So it comes from your gut, and it is put out there for others to accept it or throw it in the gutter. Many a nights I have gone back home after receiving an award, pumped up and all happy, and just to read on the internet that what I really deserved was the golden banana for the worst actor of the year award. <laughs> yeah, it's called Kela Awards or some shit like that. Yeah. Uh, and I, 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 I become heartbroken, angry and completely convinced that bananas and critics both should have their skins peeled and fed to the monkeys. I momentarily lose my ability to give and close up. And here's where the trick is. When you are in this place of despair, when you walk out of this college, this university and walk the path of life, where the world is tearing you down into yourself, there's only one thing you can do to survive. Hang on to who you are inside. The world will be unkind to you. It will not be able to see you. You must learn at such times to be able to see yourself. Life as a creative person is like walking on a tightrope. I have to keep balancing. I have to keep the balance. I begin to lose myself in my own melodrama. It is frustrating that I find myself living up to other people's interpretation of what I ought to be. And when faced with dissent or unappreciation, I start losing my love affair with my own audience. 
It becomes a tight balance act to keep doing what I do best and not be bothered by the reactions of the people I do it for in the first place. I dance harder, I can't wheel longer, and I pirouette on my rope, stretched taut beneath my feet, and I try not to slip. I can slide but never fall. And all this while, I have to keep a smile on my face and keep signing autographs and taking pictures. And why do I do this? Because I'm a funambulist, trying to balance my action and exterior reaction to my naked show of who I am inside. Yet when I'm playing this real life illusion out, more often than not, my honest self is sitting in the audience, applauding my performance while laughing heartily at my own stupidity. So my little kids and friends here, learn to laugh at yourself too. Never become cynical about yourself or your life. Becoming cynical about your life is the single most destructive thing you can do. For you have to remember, creativity is your gift to the world. It was never meant to be barter for anything, not even appreciation. You have to dig deep. I do it, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, I do it while drinking vodka and listening to really sorry songs. <laughs> but you guys have to find less destructive ways to do this. <laughs> At least till you become my age. But you have to believe that you create only because this is the biggest gift you have to give to your world. And maybe that's why we even call God a creator. It's not about the cars or houses, it never was. These are peripherals. They never come about because of your talent or your creative outpourings. They come out of a business that people around you do. Those people are in the business of barter, not you. Yours is the business of giving and learning. Your work of art may never be complete in your lifetime. Your fulfillment will always lie in your creative expression, not in its product. So look beyond the brickbats, the critics, and know within you that you always have a choice between barter and creation. Life as a creator will always be a tightrope. So do not try to feed your stomach with creativity. It is food for the soul, not your stomach. Do not be afraid to defy conventions. Do not be afraid to destroy systems that kill art and your souls. Do not be afraid to be hungry. And do not be afraid to walk alone if necessary. Because on a tightrope, we all walk alone. And remember, if you're a creator, you're a funambulist. And not very many people know what it means, let alone be it. So be a funambulist is my prayer to all you creative people here at Yale tonight. The second thing I want to tell you, and I'll go over it fast before you get to go, is love your punching bags. Just as my life has centered around creativity, like every fellow human beings, it has also centered around the wish to find happiness. Your age is the age when we most confuse happiness with gratification, so I will quite plainly tell you. If you are smart, if you want to survive life relentless onslaught of challenges, you will sooner or later understand that the things that make you happy 10 years ago will end up being the ones that make you happy when you hit the geriatric super age stage also. So kids, start collecting your action figure heroes now. I have everything I could have aspired for at your age. I have success, I have fame, I have wealth, and I have three PlayStations. <laughs> I do. I, I have one for the house, one for shootings, and one just in case because I can have one more. <laughs> but none of these... <laughs> but, but none of these have any consequence to my happiness. The only thing that does it is the love of my children. You don't have to. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Not yet. And if you have, don't tell the master. But you have parents. And you have people you love. And nothing in this world of everything means more than that. Happiness. In other words, lies in the things you will never be able to count. To me, it is no more than cuddling to my kids and watching I Kali or the family guy. Yeah. I, think, yeah, I, I, I think Family Guy is very cool. I think, I think iCarly is also very sweet. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the time I do that. The other day my son and I stumbled upon Kama Sutra on the net. <laughs> and I can tell you that experience was not very happy. He's 14 and he knew more about the poses than I did. <laughs> That's not, yeah. I want you to understand this business of happiness well because I know at one level all parents are actually the same. Some look sterner, some are less fun, some embarrassingly weird. But for each parent, the bottom and the top line of their lives is this. 
You kids are the greatest source of happiness. Parents want nothing better. Just that you respect that feeling, that's all. I'd, I'd like to narrate an incident of my own children. First of all, let me be very clear, I do believe girls are from the planet Venus. My girl comes from a place of gentleness, caring, love, intelligent, and all things beautiful. My boy comes from, I'm too good to be your son planet. <laughs> and I know, I know this may make me very unpopular, but I wanted to say this while I was uh, flying here. That if one thing that you take away from this lecture tonight, I want everyone to know, boys are obnoxious. <laughs> Slandering, lying, cheating, super serious, sneering, snobs. Those are good. Yeah. Ladki unko patane ke liye aisa karna padta hai. I, I like girls. I think girls are much better. I was in London shooting and missing my kids and I'll give you an instance. Being from the boring school of people who send writings to their kids in the hope of making them better human beings, I sent my daughter this verse from a poem by E. E. Cummins. And you guys should uh, read, the, read the poem. It's fantastic. And this poem is for all the girls here. So I want to read this out. I do not know what it is about you that closes and opens. Only something in me understands. The voice of your eyes is deeper than all roses. Nobody, not even the rain, has such small hands. And this is for all you girls, and the only smaller hands is, I guess, this little kid who's crying there. But <laughs> I sent this message to my daughter, and I instantly received this text message in return. I love it, Papa. It is beautiful. I'm going to write it in my secret diary with the secret lock and keep it in my secret hiding place under the Katy Perry and Lady Gaga poster. <laughs> you and I miss you. I'm too excited watching Hunger Games tonight. <laughs> and, <laughs> feeling, feeling bad, feeling bad that I hadn't texted something meaningful to my darling son, I sent him something I had read too. How are you my son? I wrote, I miss you. Do you know a boy is someone that a mother loves the most? Little girls hate him. He is truth with dirt on its face, beauty with a cut on its finger, wisdom with smell in its hair, and hope of the future with a frog in its pocket. I love you. He replied back with one letter of the alphabet. <laughs> no, it, it actually is very close to you. It, it had a butt in front. It says butt, and it had the Y of Yale. Why? <laughs> Why are you sending such boring messages? <laughs> and of course there was an emoticon, one of those squiggly little things, which I can't make out what they're expressing. <laughs> I wanted to fly to Mumbai and hang him upside down, upside down till he looked like a silly faced emoticon himself. <laughs> but I didn't, I just smiled and both replies made me feel love for my kids. Whatever they do, as long as they're happy, it makes me happy. So I speak to you as a parent of two very weird kids. <laughs> Whatever you do, whichever mistake you make, however you react to them, your parents are your best friends. They might be boring, silly or stern at times. Maybe some of you are embarrassed of yours. I know my kids are of me. But if ever any of you are in trouble, of any kind, the best friends you can always trust to watch your backs are your parents. They will always come good. I lost my parents very early in my life and I miss them dearly. So all of you who still have yours, don't listen to them. Fool them if you must. A bit of lying is also welcome. <laughs> but make sure you cherish what you have because when you don't have them, like me, you really miss someone to be rude to. Someone to you can, someone you can take for granted. Someone to say and do whatever you wish with. You miss the comfort of being loved unconditionally. I call parents unconditional and forgiving punching bags. Who feel happiest when they get bashed up by the kids. If you want to survive life, it's best to begin to respect the gift of love right now. As children, your first teachers of this acceptance are your parents. If you are unable to accept the love they give you, in whatever form it arrives, even if it's in the form of a tight slap across your faces, then when you become a parent, you will end up having to learn this lesson somewhat more harshly from teachers you give birth to. Those are your kids. And learning Kama Sutra from my son is not a great idea you would have <laughs> In 
incidentally, he studies in the school that Isha's mom runs in India. I have to say, ma'am, your syllabus is quite different from the one I used to study when I was there. She is, she is insisting that she will get Kama Sutra in Yale also very soon. And the last bit, a fiendish friend called failure. Whether I like it or not, my life has also been in constant play with what the world calls success. Success is a wonderful thing, but it tends not to be the sort of experience that we learn from. We enjoy it, perhaps we even deserve it, but we don't acquire wisdom from it. And maybe that's why it cannot be passed on either. Me being successful does not mean my kids are going to be successful, even if I teach them everything that I know and how to do it. So I feel that talking about success is completely a big waste of time. Instead, let me tell you very honestly, whatever happened to me happened because I've always been terrified of failure. I don't want as much to succeed as much as I don't want to fail. I come from a very normal, low middle class family. I saw a lot of failure. My father was a beautiful man and the most successful failure in the world. My mother also failed to stay long, long enough with me to see me become a big movie star. We were quite poor actually and let me tell you, poverty is not an ennobling experience at all. Poverty entails fear and stress and sometimes depression. I watched my parents go through this several times. At an early age after my parents died, I equated poverty with failure. I just didn't want to be poor. So when I got a chance to act in films, it wasn't out of any creative desire, I say this honestly. It was purely out of the fear of failure and poverty. Most of the films I signed were discards of better known actors and the producers could not find anyone else to do them. I did them all to make sure that I was working to, to avoid unemployment. The timing or something was right, I worked very hard, there were other people around it and I became a big star, the films became big hits. Which means sometimes our success is not the direct result of our actions and let nobody tell you that. Success sometimes just happens, really. It is accidental and we have to take credit for it. I do it sometimes sheerly out of embarrassment. So I believe the true path to success is through the fear of failure. If you aren't scared enough to, of failing, you're unlikely to succeed. It's not pleasant to fail, it's tough. All of us experience it. You will too, if you haven't already. So use it to succeed. How I've done is, a few points I'd like to say, and then I'll end this monologue. Firstly, it's not the absence of failure that makes you success, that, that makes success. It is your response to failure that actually helps to buffer the reverses that you experience. I personally have one response to failure. Pragmatism, a recognition and belief that if one approach does not work, then the other will or might. Failure also gives me an incentive to greater, greater exertion, harder work, which invariably leads to later success in most cases. Repeated failure has taught me to stop pretending I'm someone else. It's given me the clarity to stick to things that really matter to me instead of distracting me from my core. Failure also gets you to find who your real friends are. The true strength of your relationships only gets tested in the face of strong adversity. Overcoming some of my failures has made me discover that I have a strong will and more discipline than I suspected. It has helped me to have confidence in my ability to survive. Failure is an amazing teacher. There's a well-known story of this very successful man and a reporter asked him, Sir, how is it that you always succeed? And he said, uh, right decisions. I said, how do you make right decisions? And he says, we are experienced. Says, how do you get so experienced? He said, wrong decisions and failure. <laughs> so do fail. And it's all right to fail. You have to know and learn that life is not just a checklist of acquisitions, attainments, and fulfillments. Your qualifications and CVs don't really matter. Instead, life is difficult and complicated and beyond anyone's control. The humility to know it will help you survive its vicissitudes. This is the second big word that I <laughs> But I don't want to sound dark. My hope for all of you is that you retain a lifelong love of learning, that you never cease to dream exciting and inspiring dreams. And when you fail, you don't, and you fail, you fail well enough to succeed the next time. Don't be afraid of being afraid. Be afraid of not facing your fears and failures. As I was coming here, and this is my dream, I was telling the press outside when I walked in here. 
uh, I sent a message to my little daughter who's 11 and a half, my son 14, and I said it's one of the most beautiful institutions I've seen in my life. Genuinely, you guys are fortunate to be studying here. Uh, and actually, I, I really wish my kids are good enough like you, all young boys and girls and all the parents who help them do this, are good enough to reach here and study and get this opportunity. So I wrote to my daughter and said, it's so pretty and nice and beautiful, I wish you could come and study here. And she sent me back a long message, as she always does. Is it pretty, Papa? Is it nice? Is it snowing there? Because I told her last time I was here it was snowing. And my son sent me one alphabet. <laughs> K. <laughs> Which I have understood when you extend means OK. Yeah. <laughs> and for some reason, he's also written, Papa, Chuck Norris has trained his dog to pick up its own poop. Because Chuck Norris will not take shit from anyone. <laughs> so, so remember all boys and girls, that you're fortunate enough to be funambulists. You have an amazing set of punching bags, your parents cherish them always. And failure is your fiendish friend, keep him close. And as my son sent a message, don't take no shit from anybody. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you, you all.